Right before I went on tour for Water for Elephants, my mother sent me an email with a link to the Great Ape Trust and about the work they were doing there. And it's, it's uh, about language acquisition and cognition in great apes. And I have been a um, lifelong fan of Coco the gorilla and Washoe the chimpanzee and really very interested in the, the possibility of having trans-species communications in, with, within a language. And um, so I was doubly fascinated because, first of all, I had this, this fascination. Um, and second of all, I'd never heard about bonobo apes. And uh, so I spent a couple of days looking around their site and really came out of it just knowing that that's where, what I had to do next. The Great Ape Trust studies cogn cognition and language abilities in great apes. And I obviously became connected with them because I saw that initial email and got interested. And then I needed their help in order to research this book. And then I became personal friends with these six great apes. Uh, there are orangutans there as well, but I didn't get to know them as you know as well as I did the bonobos. Um, but it's really it's really pretty incredible knowing that you have six great apes as, as personal friends and that who remember you and you know we communicate and back and forth even when we're not in person um so yes i mean you know the great ape trust is is the is the inspiration behind the great ape language lab in my book and the bonobos the bonobo family there is in fact the inspiration for the bonobo family in my book the first thing i needed to do was get access to the Great Ape Trust. I really, really wanted in to meet the bonobos. Apparently a whole lot of people want to get in to meet the bonobos, and so they assign you with a lot of homework to kind of weed out who's serious and who's not. And that research included doing, uh, reading many, many books, and um, also going to York University in Toronto and doing a crash course on linguistics there with some of the scientists who are working with the Great Ape Trust. and. When I finally did that, I got an invitation to the trust, but that did not necessarily mean that I was going to get to visit the apes because the apes at the trust are entirely in control. So I got there. I, I wanted to, I wanted to um, stack my odds as much as possible, and so I bought all of their favorite gifts. I researched them online. I bought their favorite gifts, their favorite foods. Their, you know, I bought Mr. Potato Heads, bouncy balls, fleecy blankets, M and M's peanuts, you know, all the things, everything I thought that an ape might find fascinating or fun. And I gave them each backpacks. And so I'd sent a note to the scientists ahead of time saying, I'm coming with surprises. Can you please tell the apes? And so after my orientation, yes, yes, I've done your homework. Yes, I've read this. Yes, I've read this. Yes, I did that. I said, Can, but will the apes see me? And they went off and consulted with the apes and said, oh, yes, not only will they see you, they're insisting on seeing you. And so I got to spend the afternoon with them. That was the first visit. And it was really, you know, I don't know if I could have done this book without it because you, it's, it's really interesting to read about apes who are using human language. And it's an entirely other thing to experience it and actually have a two-way conversation with a great ape. And so I stayed there all afternoon, basically until the scientists had to go home for dinner and uh, they had to drag me out, and, and the bonobos were, you know, no, no, you have to come out to the play yard and meet our mother. And it was really, if by then, we'd just, we'd broken all the ice, and it was just a really open conversation. And the day after I left, Pam Benicia, one of the, um, she's actually one of the Shire apes there, but she and I really clicked. She said to the scientists, where's Sarah? Build her nest. When's she coming back? And so obviously I had to send them a Fruit of the Month club so they'd remember me and, and still want me to come back. And so I've, I've been visiting regularly and I've, I've got two more visits coming up in the, in the near future so I can go back and see them. But it's, it's uh, speaking with a great ape in your own language is just amazing. I just don't have any other word for it. The bonobos at the Great Ape Trust use a series of lexigrams, which are pictorial representations of words. Um, they use them both on a computer. If they're using a computer, then the computer has a synthesized human voice that says the word. But they also uh, carry around laminated lexigram boards. And so if you're actually fluent in 
the lexigrams, you can go out in the forest and have a conversation with them. It's a very complicated lexigram board. It's available at the Great Ape Trust's website, and I tried to learn it. I tried really hard to learn it before my first visit. But it was funny. It was after my second visit when it's kind of like French immersion classes, that when you're actually there and on the spot, you, you kind of figure out where they are, and you just, that was, that's, I think that's how you learn it. But yes, they use, they use lexigram boards. I had bought the Fruit of the Month Club, so they, I was not a stranger at that point, and so they were looking forward to my visit. They knew I was bringing them presents, and, um, and it was a huge deal for them. They, they'd been talking about it for a week, and it was, you know, so Pam Benicia knew that the book is dedicated to her. And so she was getting um, sort of star treatment. And when she heard I was getting my makeup done before the photo shoot, she wanted her makeup done. And so she got, you know, lipstick and powder and got her makeup done. And then she invited me out to a tea party in the forest. And she spread out the blanket. She set out the cookies. She made the tea. She has her own kitchen at the Great Ape Trust. She chose blackberry for her and earl gray for me. And we sat out there in the forest drinking tea. She, she, you know, she said, would you like milk with your tea? And I said, yes, please. And then I gave it back to her and she went, glug. It was this crazy sort of human ape thing, you know. And then she, she told me which cookies to eat first and which ones I should dip in the tea. And then she said, are you finished with your cookies? And I handed her my plate and she went, <laughs> tipped him and it, it, so she was it was apparently Tuesdays are diet days and I was there on a Tuesday so she was just taking advantage of this. I think the most surprising thing was just how competent these apes are in language. I was not expecting them to use tenses. I was not expecting them to use uh, fully grammatical sentences and they do. They have a complete concept of time and and space. My entire world is filled with animals and it's it's you know, people ask me, oh, have you always been this way? And that's like asking me, why is my hair brown? I don't know, and I didn't actually realize I was any particular way until people started asking me. But yes, I just, I've, my world is filled with animals, and, and uh, so my fiction is too. I, I, I write at least eight hours a day, and it just makes sense to me that if I'm going to have animals around me all the time in my, in my own world, um, why would I not choose to have them around me in, in that other world? I try to make all of my books different, so I hope that my readers are always surprised. But I don't think that they'll find any of the themes here particularly disturbing or really off base from anything else I've done. But there are, there are surprises. There are, there are things I look at that I haven't looked at in other books, and they have to read to find out more. I, I found out that it hit number one when I got a, a speakerphone I got a, a phone call from my publisher, and everybody was on, and just, wah! And, and, um, and so then Bob and I, my husband Bob and I, uh, we got some champagne. And then I, I remember the very night I was drinking champagne and folding laundry, and I thought, well, this is just sort of a perfect, <laughs> perfect look at my life, <laughs> having champagne and folding underwear. I don't think I actually believed that it was real until probably a year in because it, it had sort of a slow burn. My editor at the, at the time thought it was going to be a small book and um, it, didn't, it didn't burst out of the gates. It just it, it kind of ignited and so I was always tapping myself on the back and, and knocking wood and, um, and so on and I really it was a long time before I believed it because, you know, writing is a really hard road. It's the, the, if, if I had known the chances of making it or the chances of not making it, I probably would not have tried it. So in this case, ignorance was bliss. But, but no, it took a very long time for me to believe that it actually was happening. I hope that people who read Ape House have come away from it thinking about how we treat our closest cousins and also about how we treat each other. And also I want them to have had a rollicking good ride. <laughs> In the end, um, I still believe that fiction is about transporting a person and, and, and providing a good story.